Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. And uh, today we're doing Community Matters with Mike Hansen, and he runs the Shippers Council, the Hawaii Shippers Council, which involves people who ship things, especially on the ocean, um, to and from Hawaii, and he follows what's going on uh, for the shippers. Uh, hi, Mike. Thank you for coming down. Uh, thank you for having me, Jay. I enjoy being here. And your piece this time is about, uh, is about LNG and um, the Jones Act and a move that is co uh, uh, contemplated by the President Donald Trump. Can you talk about it? Sure. Uh, basically, it is uh, the President uh, proposing to make a Jones Act waiver of 10 years uh, to allow for a foreign flag uh, LNG or liquefied natural gas carriers, those are a kind of ship, uh, to transport LNG from one place in America to another in contravention of the Jones Act. Yeah, the, the intercoastal trade. But you know, well, one thing I get is that the, actually, that, the, that it, seems to the, assume, go ahead. The intercoastal trade is, an, is a legal term that applies to trade from one part of the United States to the other through the Panama Canal. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, okay, that would, that would have a big effect on things if it works. But let me, let me uh, just say that, you know, when you, when you frame it that way, it seems to make the assumption that the United States is not in a position to build um, LNG ships. Is this true? Um, right. Uh, first of all, let's uh, maybe a quick review of the Jones Act for yeah, people please, who may not uh, remember. Uh, the, the Jones Act is uh, a common reference uh, to various maritime, domestic maritime laws uh, that is used informally. If you look in, through the U.S. Code, you'll not find a single statute that includes the term Jones Act. So it's an informal term. What's the legal term? <laughs> uh, generically, worldwide, these kinds of laws are known as maritime cabotage. And uh, in American jurisprudence, they're known as the coastwise laws of the United States. Okay. But everyone uses the term Jones Act. And the general rule of the Jones Act is, and has been since the 19 teens somewhere, uh, 19 what? 1920, anyway. Uh, is the, the, uh, when, the, when Jones Act is used in the narrowest common sense, it generally refers to Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. Okay. That applies to the carriage of cargo by, over, by water between two domestic points. And you can't do it unless the ship and the crew on the ship and the flag on the ship qualify under yeah, the Jones Act. There's two parts to that, really. One applies to the vessel, which is the purview of the Coast Guard. And that is the ship must be uh, built in the U.S., registered as a vessel of the United States, i.e. U.S. flag, uh, owned mostly by U.S. citizens and crewed mostly by U.S. citizens. Uh, a small part of the crew can be uh, green card holders or uh, resident aliens. The other side is uh, done by customs or the Customs and Border Patrol today. And that is the movement of ships and cargoes domestically. And they're in control of that. And uh, basically, uh, a foreign flag vessel can make uh, multiple port calls in the United States on a, on a given voyage. And it can discharge foreign cargo loaded at a foreign port, and it can load export cargo for a foreign country. But it cannot but deliver it can, cargo from can, one port to another. It cannot load domestic cargo from, at one U.S. port and transport it to another. And the, and the purpose of all of that? Well, uh, the purpose... People think that this uh, originated in 1920. It didn't. It originated in the, uh, there's two laws uh, early in our history, in the country's history. One was passed in the first session of the first Congress after ratification of the Constitution. And that was basically a law that uh, uh, established a customs service and uh, uh, a vessel registry. 
And to register a vessel as a U.S. vessel in 1789 required that it be built in the United States, owned wholly by U.S. citizens, and mostly crewed by U.S. citizens. Cabotage. That was not a cabotage law. That was for any vessel to be registered U.S., whether it was in domestic or foreign trade. Okay. 1817, after the War of 1812, there was a dispute between the U.S. and Britain regarding uh, U.S. ships uh, taking cargo into the British West Indies, which was a big trade in colonial times. The British, had, after the Revolutionary War, had excluded the U.S. Uh, from that market while the Americans had continued to allow British ships to carry cargo domestically within the United States. Finally, the, U the, the U.S., they attempted several times to uh, work out a treaty uh, to sort this out. Didn't work. And so in 1817, the Congress passed a true cabotage law that excluded foreign ships from domestic trade. So between those two laws, we have the parameters of what we know today as the Jones Act. Mm. So, the, but the Jones Act in 1920, you said, um, uh, was uh, at least in part for the preservation of the shipbuilding industry in the United States, right? Uh, there were 39 sections in that law, two of which were cabotage. One, one was section 27, uh, which applied to the movement of, of uh, commodities uh, and goods by water, and the other one, which uh, extended uh, the coastwise laws to all of the island dependencies of the U.S. Okay, so moving from there to LNG, we now have a huge LNG uh, supply in this country. Our technology has found it and can process it. Uh, there are global markets which are worth billions upon billions if we can deliver LNG uh, overseas. Right. Um, and we can't manufacture, we just don't have the capacity to manufacture the big tanker ships for mm -hmm. LNG. Uh, domestically, that would qualify under the Jones yeah. Act. Uh, first of all, LNG refers to liquefied natural gas. Thank you. And uh, to ship natural gas, you need what's known as an export terminal. And an export terminal, an LNG export terminal, marine terminal, uh, consists of a liquefaction plant to take uh, natural gas from its ambient temperature and pressure to, to liquefy it. Make it a liquid and then and you, the, and, you and, actually and, store it as a liquid on the ship. It will have to be stored on the shore first. So when the ship arrives, there's a cargo there for it to load. Okay. And the uh, LNG now is at minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And you have to keep it cold. Uh, it actually keeps pretty cold itself. Uh, most of the LNG carriers, these are the ships that actually carry the LNG, are basically giant thermoses. And those they, are tanks, round spherical tanks that's the, on the ship? Th those spherical tanks are an old style, and the new ones uh, are not in that configuration. What do they look like? Uh, they're, they're actually rectangular. Uh, are they above deck or below deck? Oh, below deck, yeah. And uh, they've got uh, uh, special kinds of uh, insulation so that, you know, if the LNG ever touched the steel in the hull, the steel would crack. Right. It's so cold. Right. So it's got to be insulated. and. Uh, so for an LNG, uh, not only do you have to make an LNG uh, transaction by water, you need the export terminal where you can, that turns uh, natural gas into LNG, stores it for loading on a ship, but then on the receiving end, you have to have an LNG receiving terminal that will receive the LNG cargo, store it, and then regasify it so it can be used as natural gas. Mm -hmm. This and is really, this is very important to uh, the American economy because we have so much of it. And because it's such a market overseas, we, we could make tons and tons of money. Uh, yes. Are we making any money with LNG oh, sure. overseas yes. now? Uh, How do we do that? Uh, there are uh, three operating terminals 
export terminals now, LNG export terminals, two on the Gulf and one on the East Coast. So we're already doing it? Yes. And what kinds of ships are we using to move it? It's all moving by foreign flag or foreign LNG carriers. So what's the point of, um, of having the waiver so that you can move the LNG from port to port around the country? Uh, that's correct. Uh, what's the point of it? it well, you can have the foreign flag come in, pick well, up the LNG, and leave again. Typically, uh, the uh, natural gas is moved by pipeline across the contiguous U.S. That's, you know, the lower 48 or the mainland U.S. How as you gas. Want to, right, as gas. Uh, under, uh, it's usually moved under some pressure, but normally at ambient temperature. And there's no real gasification process to, at the other end. So you save all the money of those processing plants. No. Ex oh, yeah. You never uh, have to liquefy uh, it. Turning it into a LNG is very expensive. Uh, it's much more economical if you can simply move it by gas pipeline. Aren't we able to do that right now, moving it around yes, the country? But, yes. But of course, the non-contiguous jurisdictions, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, don't have pipelines mm. too far away. So you have to use LNG to and reach it them. It has to go to LNG on a ship and then to them. Okay. Is that then, what this waiver is about? Well, there's also places in the United States that are not really served by gas pipeline. For example, New England. Much of New England is not served by gas pipeline, mm. and, uh, or not sufficiently served. And they end up having to import uh, natural gas from foreign sources. And, and we one, have so much of it here, that's really silly, isn't and, it? And the one that raised everybody's hackles is last year, they actually imported uh, a cargo of Russian gas <laughs> from the <laughs> Arctic. <laughs> when we have so much gas right here. <laughs> right. And so you don't have any way of getting the gas from the export terminals that are already in existence to receiving terminals where it's in it. For example, on Puerto Rico uses a large amount of uh, gas for electrical production. And they have a receiving terminal on the island. And most of their gas comes from Trinidad. Hmm. And yet on the Gulf Coast, which is what, a f less than 1,000 miles away from Puerto Rico, you've got two operating uh, uh, LNG export terminals. But no ships. And, and at, at, a, at a much lower price than you can obtain this stuff from, from uh, Trinidad or other places in the world. But no ships. So why doesn't an American entrepreneur, uh, a shipbuilder, and there are shipbuilders in what Louisiana, uh, why don't they get some? Why don't they get some plans to, to have uh, these container ships uh, fitted for LNG and move it around not on an American ships. hull? Yeah, the, uh, uh, and not a container ship, right. but a, a the cargo L ship. The LNG carrier is a highly specialized cryogenic tanker, mm. and we uh, don't have any of them. There are zero in the Jones Act fleet. That's, now, that's worth thinking about for at least one minute. Let me say it again. I'm just quoting you, Mike. There are zero LNG carriers, carriers that qualify. In the, in the Jones Act fleet. That qualify in the Jones Act fleet that qualify in the Jones Act. Think about that. Zero. Right. This is the most you know, economically productive and successful country in the world. We have zero um, LNG carriers in the Jones Act fleet. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Abicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much.
Back to Community Matters uh, with Mike Hansen, who uh, leads the uh, Hawaii Shippers Council. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking about it during the break. It's uh, no less stunning after the break that we have zero Jones Act LNG ships, zero. Um, why? Not, we, not only do we not have any at the present time, we've actually never had one in the Jones Act fleet. And we have no plans either. That's correct. Why? Yeah. why? What are the factors that make that separate for, us from for, the possibility? For, first of all, you have to be able to qualify as a Jones Act ship. It has to be built in the United States. Yeah. And that means that you have to have a shipyard capable of building this vessel. Don't we? We and, have at least two major shipyards in Louisiana that and, build military ships. At, at some kind of a, a, a commercial cost that's palatable. You know, otherwise too expensive. Yeah, doesn't doesn't pencil out. And 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 well, furthermore, not only, not only does it, well, there are in the United States today, there are seven what are known as major shipbuilding yards in the United States, and these are uh, yards that are capable of constructing self-propelled seagoing ships of a thousand gross tons and over, including yeah. military ships that are that big. Yes, and of the seven, four build only for the Navy. Okay. Two build only commercial. Why don't we have more? Isn't there any money in this? I mean, other countries are building ships like hotcakes. Korea, for example. Yeah. Well, two can build, two build commercial, and one of those is attempting to convert itself from a commercial shipbuilder to a military shipbuilder. That's the one that delivered the last two new uh, Matson container ships. Because so, the, the Jones Act fleet is built out. The problem that we have in the United States is our shipbuilding industry, major shipbuilding industry, is very inefficient. Our cost of construction is about five times that of South Korea. So and, it's never going to pencil out. And the only way you, and for example, this is the Philadelphia, Philly shipyard in Pennsylvania, which delivered the last two container ships for Matson, the uh, Daniel K. Inouye and the Kaimana Hilo. Those that, there are no more commercial orders available for the yard to build. Wow. Because there, uh, you have to look, the, the shipbuilding, the major shipbuilding, not tugs and barges, but the major shipbuilding industry, self-propelled seagoing ships. This is like uh, the, airline industry. You have, you know, around the world, you've got what? Boeing and Airbus building the big planes. Right. You have to be able to uh, uh, build for export and sale on the international market. There's, uh, for, uh, between Japan, South Korea, and China, they build north of 95% of all of the large seagoing ships in the world. I mean, it's extraordinary. You and wonder then, why we don't have manufacturing in this we, country, we have, we have, we because have, we're inefficient. Well, in this particular sector, yeah. I mean, we're efficient in some other sectors, but not this one. Yeah, and we, we wind up building for the military, and then that means the military is paying way too much, doesn't it? That's why we, that's why we can't maintain the fleet level we need, because each vessel uh, consumes so much of the budget that you don't have anything left over. Let's take a magnitude issue on this. So if I'm building, say, a Matson ship, oh, I don't know, what is that, a thousand feet, something like that, container yeah. ship? Say a thousand foot Matson ship. Well, and what, I, what you want to do is talk about the capacity. The, the, the capacity, capacity of the last two Matson ships was 3,600 20 foot equivalent units. Okay. That means the ship can carry, can carry uh, 3,600 20 foot shipping containers. Okay. So for that ship, 3,600 20-foot containers, um, what does it cost me to, to build it in the U.S. at a U.S. shipyard? Uh, what does it cost those, me to build those, it in those, South Korea? Those two ships were delivered for uh, $205 million apiece. Okay, and the, in South the, Korea? The, the shipyard lost $60 million building those two ships. Well, how did it lose $60 million? Because, they, it, because they underpriced it. And, uh, it would have been more had they priced it correctly with their own costs. Exactly. So it would, it would be uh, I mean, $235 million apiece. 
Okay. You what about buy, you, South you can, Korea? You can buy that same ship in South Korea for around 40 million. Now, so that's 25%. That's yeah. Wait, I get that right? Less, less, yeah. Way less than, it's like 15%. <laughs> it's, it's less than a fifth. Less than 15% of what it would Less than a fifth. Uh, then would you have to pay in the American industry, shipyard right. industry? Now, uh, the, the ships, the two ships that were delivered by Philly Shipyard to Massa, they were designed by a shipyard in South Korea. The main <laughs> engine was provided by that same shipyard. <laughs> Most of the deck equipment and other equipment was purchased <laughs> from Europe. So what I get out of this is that our <laughs> ship industry is, is propped up by building Military ships at, at way too much money. And commercial and, ships for the Jones Act. And trade. commercial ships for the Jones Act because they have to be built, you know, that way right. in, in the U.S. for Jones Act. No, uh, the, G, the GAO estimated uh, you, can, you can get a, a large LNG carrier built in South Korea with about a two year delivery time uh, for around $200 million. If, it, if if it were to be built in the United States, nobody knows what the cost really would be. But the GAO is estimating $700 million. What, what I hear from you and, is that... And a, five years delivery. Wow. And I know people who Nobody's are... Nobody's going to pay that. I know people who are in the, um, in the business of uh, ship construction and that sort of thing and know both U.S. And, and, and South Korean yards. They say it'll be a billion. Oh, Wow. Nobody's going to pay that. It's not going to pencil out. It's not going to, you know, you, you, get, you get no return on your investment. And, 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 it, and, it's, and the delivery is on the never-never, so who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But $200 million is a lot of money sure. uh, in South Korea. And that, what you're really telling me is that to build um, an LNG and, and ship... And wages in South Korean yards are comparable to those in the U.S. today. Interesting. So the inefficiency is, is really rampant in the U.S. <laughs> you know, using the same wages... Gee, yeah. they're, they're, they're over the hill. It's what it is. They're over the hill. Well, um, I've, uh, I've done some, uh, some tracking on the production of these large ocean-going self-propelled ships. Um, the U.S. has, uh, since uh, 2000, the U.S. has delivered uh, around 2.75 ships, commercial ships per year. But in Asia, they, they the build world, dozens and dozens world and dozens. World production is 1,500 ships a year. 1,500 ships a year. Oh, not dozens at all. Yeah. Well, we're losing that game. In fact, it sounds to me like we've lost that game. We've probably lost the expertise. Um, we've um, lost the infrastructure. Unless you can ex, you have to be able to build for export because but, you cannot rely on the Jones Act market. Right. It's insufficient. It's artificial. But it's insufficient. Yeah. You, you have, it's the, the business of, of uh, building large commercial ships yeah. is a, a worldwide business. We, we've, we've lost it already. We're, we're riding on, on an artificial momentum. Um, and and the, the world has taken our industry by storm, and it's our own fault. You know? So anyway, let's go back to the main point, though. We don't have the ships to do the... Do the intercoastal, may I use that term again? Coastal. Coastwise. No, coastal. Coastal trade. You got, coast, yeah, I, you got coastal, which refers to <laughs> uh, east and Gulf Coast. And you got Pacific Coast. Yeah. And then you have via Panama Canal intercoastal. Intercoastal. And then you have non-contiguous trade. Okay. <laughs> All right. But within the United States kind of trade, okay, however you want to classify that. Um, we that, don't have the ships to do it. Yeah. We don't have really any ships, zero ships to do it. We must rely on, on foreign carriers, foreign ships that don't qualify under the Jones Act. And therefore, this administration is contemplating um, a waiver uh, of, those, of those ships, uh, of foreign ships, for carrying LNG. Right. Okay. Um, what, is, what, is the, mm, what is the reason for all of that? Uh, what, is the, uh, what, what, is the, um, uh, what is the administration saying about it? Where is the political pressure coming from? Can you talk about it? Uh, political pressure is, uh, well, this was all started by a request from the uh, governor of Puerto Rico, Rossello. Who needs, who needs the gas to run electrical plants in Puerto Rico. That's correct. The Lord knows they need fuel. Yes. And uh, they can source... LNG cheaper from the U.S. from the from the ex existing two LNG export terminals 
uh, in, on the U.S. Gulf Coast as opposed to importing it from... And, and Lord from, knows they from, need to from, save from, money. From, they don't from, have any money. From Trinidad. Yeah, yeah. And then there's also on the, uh, in New England, uh, during the winter, they have insufficient supply of pipeline gas and they have to import LNG. And instead of importing LNG from foreign sources, they would like to be able to buy the LNG from the Gulf, which is a very reasonable thing. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so the, the administration hears the voices and they're you know, persuasive voices, I guess. Well, they're not only they're, uh, the people who are interested in, in receiving the LNG, but there's also the people who produce the LNG. Want to sell it to Asia. They would, uh, they would also like to sell it to other U.S. citizens. Got it. <laughs> Got it. And to those inaccessible places. Right. And so, then there, there's the question of Alaska. Alaska is developing a gas pipeline from the North Slope to parallel the oil pipeline. They've got enormous uh, reserves of uh, conventional gas on the North Slope. But no pipe. No pipeline and no export terminal. Right. They want to build an export terminal. Uh, they've identified a site on Cook Inlet. They would like to be able to export LNG to California and Hawaii. Mainland U.S., yeah, and Hawaii, for sure. <laughs> okay, there's, there's so many reasons. It's really tragic that we have to rely on foreign ships to do this. But um, I guess that's the motivation. It's sad that we don't have our own ships. It really is. Um, why 10 years? Is this supposed to be a significant... Uh, a window in order to permit them well, to do this? Was the, Are we going to be able to catch up in the 10 years? This was the request of the uh, governor of Puerto Rico. They requested 10 years. And the reason they did that is because they have to sign what are known as offtake contracts from the export terminal. For the fuel. For the, for the LNG. Yeah. And they need to be able to contract shipping. And much of this has to be done on, on a, uh, on a uh, multi-year basis. And so by having a 10-year window, they can, uh, they can accomplish this. Now, this, this means something to Hawaii, because if you start giving a waiver, well, first of all, we have a waiver on LNG, even though the state of Hawaii, mm, under David Ige, doesn't like LNG, there's still a possibility under another governor, another administration, we would get to like it. Well, we, we might take a look at the AES coal plant, that whose permit expires, I think in 20, uh, 20, uh, 20, enough, 23, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. They're the low cost producer, very low cost. They're the ones who are keeping a cap on our electrical rates. The here. AES coal. Yes. Once they go away. We better find something else. <laughs> and we're going to keep the prices down, yeah. Otherwise, the prices will go, you know, people, people are leaving so, to go to the mainland now. So we would benefit, assuming we can find a way to accept LNG. And you, have, you, have, you have to build an LNG receiving terminal. About 10 million? 20? 30? Uh, closer to half. Half, 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 a, half, half a bill? Half a bill. Half a billion. Because you have to, you have, to have the, the berth, you have to have the, uh, the storage tank, yeah. and the regasification. It's a big problem. And, That's a lot of bread. And then you have to have the pipelines. Huge. Yeah. Huge. But there and are, it's there, a bridge fuel for but, us, but, right? But, there, but there's companies in the world that will install this. Mm. Mitsui's one of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but it's still so much money. And, you know, people... But over time and the amount of fuel that you... It's just, it, okay, it doesn't right, okay. I mean, sure, it's a large amount num, uh, so of money. One last question before we break, before we finish. Um, as you said at the beginning, this would be a good you know, moved by the Trump administration, quote, if it works. There's some question about whether it would work. Yeah. Uh, what they're talking about using, there's an existing statute, uh, waiver of the, co of the navigation and coastwise laws. And under that, uh, there's two sections. One that applies to uh, military cargoes, and the other one that applies to commercial cargoes. And basically, on the commercial side, it says, if there are no existing uh, coastwise eligible ships, then you can get a waiver. It's, and it doesn't state the period of time. It doesn't say how restrictive it has to be. It's really wide open. All the uh, waivers that have been uh, issued in the past under this second section, which, and the, the waiver, the first waiver was uh, uh, just after 2000, the year 2000. 
uh, have been very short term. They've generally specified where the load ports were, where the discharge ports were, and given a week or two uh, to complete the process of loading and discharge. So very narrow. Uh, Trump, the Trump administration is looking at, since there are no real limitations in the statute, can we go ahead and do a blanket waiver for 10 years? Even if during the 10 years we could find uh, qualifying ships. Someone would have to build it. So is, would somebody oppose this? Would somebody take this to court? Of course. The Jones Act industry will take it to court. And they'll sue the administration. Oh, the shipyards. Not only the shipyards, but the ship owner, the Jones Act ship owners, they're all represented by an organization known as the American Maritime Partnership. And they would oppose it. It started life as the Maritime Cabotage Task Force. And they would oppose uh, any exemption, any waiver of the Jones Act. They, they would preserve they, it. They, in they every generally way. oppose any waiver that's even granted now mm. under very short term. They should lose that case. Right? <laughs> Mike you're, Hansen, you're the lawyer. Hawaii Shippers <laughs> Council, thank you so much for coming around and helping us understand this. We'll see what happens. Thanks for having me, Joe. Aloha. Okay. <laughs>